God is on the throne and prayer changes things. Father, we pray that there may be a change in our understanding of the purpose, O oh God, of sending Jesus into the world. Help the prophet here, O oh God, to be able, O oh Lord, to, to share it in such a way that people will walk away with a fresh look and a fresh understanding and who and what you are and, and who is Jesus. This I pray and this I ask in Jesus' name and for his name's sake, amen. Uh, today I want to talk about the difference between religion and a relationship. Uh, what's the difference between being in a rela religion or being in a relationship when it comes to God? And Let's look in the book of John chapter 8, verse 19. Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. What a amazing um, statement that Jesus made. He, he says, you don't know me nor my father. He's talking to people who went to church. How is it that one can be in a faith and be in their church and be in their particular religion like these people were and yet not know the Lord. You neither know me nor my father for if you have known me you would have knew my father also. Look at verse 55 in this same book. Yet you have not known him but I know him, and if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you, but I do know him and keep his word. What a statement. He told them they had no clue who God was and who he was. See, in verse 48, they said this to him in this chapter. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? See, he was full of the Holy Ghost. And they thought both him and the Holy Ghost were demons. Continue. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Notice what he says. He says, I honor my father, and you dishonor me. That's one disadvantage of being in religion. It dishonors God. And it takes someone like Jesus and make him demonic. Watch this, continue. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Notice he didn't come to seek his glory, but that of his father, continue. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets who are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. So notice he says, in religion, People say that God is their God, yet they don't know him, nor Jesus, nor the Holy Spirit. Religion blocks you from knowing God. Religion blocks you from knowing Jesus, the Christ. Religion will block you from having an experience in a relationship with the Holy Ghost. Continue. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. And I keep his word. What a, what a statement. Because they th also said they kept the word. The word of Moses, the word of the prophets. Because remember it says, 
Are you greater than the prophets? I mean, they all did. And well, well not all of them was dead. Um, I mean, I mean, God sent them John at that time, but they would not submit to John baptism. Because religion had already had a way of dealing with sin. Sacrifice it. You can tell those that are religious because they will use sacrifice to justify sin. And so in the Old Testament, there was a way to deal with sin. You brought an offering to the priest. And you'll find it in a lot of our religious, religious sects today, Christian sects, by the way, that people bring sacrifices, offerings, or tithes, and they say that's enough to deal with their sin. But when one is in a relationship with God, they repent of their sins and confess them openly. Continue. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. You see, in the days of Abraham, he had no religion. He was in Methodist, Baptist, Catholic, Pentecostal. He wasn't even Jewish. Abraham is not Jewish. He wasn't a Muslim. He wasn't a Buddhist. He wasn't Hindu. See, God told Abraham, walk before me and let me correct you. Let me direct you. He said to Abraham, I am your shield and your exceeding reward. Get to know me. So when you go all the way back to the beginning, Adam had no religion. His son Seth had no religion. His son Enos had no religion. His son Canaan had no religion. Uh, none of these boys had religion. <clears throat> you get up to Enoch. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> you get up to Enoch, and Enoch ain't a religion. And yet he walked with God without a religion, and God took him. The writer Hebrew says he had this testimony that before he was translated, raptured, we call it in the New Testament, before he was raptured, he had this testimony. He pleased God. He pleased God without religion. Then you get to Methuselah, his son who lived 969 years old, the oldest man in the world with no religion. How do you live that long? The answer, don't have a religion. Have a relationship. How do you get translated? Don't have a religion. Have a relationship. Then you get his son, Lamech, who prophesied before Noah is born, I'm going to have a child and he's going to comfort us because of the curse that happened all the way in Adam. He named him Noah. And Noah, without religion, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the same eyes that the prophet wrote that the eyes of God run to and fro in all the earth looking for hearts that want a relationship with him. So Noah wanted to have a relationship with God. So God warned him of a judgment that was coming on the earth. And the writer of Hebrews says, and Noah moved with fear to save in his household. What a revelation. All of these people I mentioned so far never had religion. But they all had a relationship with God. So when the Hebrews came out of Egypt, because they say they did not want to have a relationship with God, he gave them religion. Religion is for those who don't want a relationship with God. Continue. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, 
And have you seen Abraham? See, Abraham had a relationship with our Lord. He told them, I had a relationship with Abraham. But because they did not know him, they wanted to kill him. Continue. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. That word was is before he was birthed. I was already birthed. I was already there. I have no beginning and I have no end. He says, and then he says that he was the I am. So Moses had a relationship with our Lord. Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, we're not turning there. He said that all of the people that I name had the spirit of Christ in them without religion. Let's look at that because I, 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 that'd be good if people see that. First Peter 1 starting with verse 9. How is it we can have a relationship with God without religion and then in religion not have a relationship? Go ahead. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. So the, receiving this, this, this end, you might have started with this walk through religion, like I did. I started with religion. And then God showed me who his son was. I started as a Catholic. But I had scales over my eyes, not knowing really who the father was and who his son was. I only knew who he was by the teaching of the Catholic Church, which I was a member. But when it came time for me to know him personally, I actually met him personally. I was what we call born again. Continue here in Peter. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. Who so I got a salvation that the prophets, they, they inquired of. How is... What is different about Prophet Ern and Prophet Jeremiah? What is the difference between Prophet Aaron and Ezekiel? What is the difference between Prophet Ern and Daniel? Because Daniel knew that I had a salvation different from his. What was it? Go ahead. Who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. He pro they prophesied that a grace was coming to me where they had religion. I would have relationship. Continue. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So Christ was in them signifying about this grace that, you remember now, I got saved by grace through faith. It was a gift of God. We are living in a dispensation where we can get grace to be saved, to have a relationship with God. That's why Jesus came in the flesh. He wanted to give us a visual representation of a relationship because before he would be taken away and then send us another comforter known as the Holy Spirit, a spirit, because God is a spirit. He wanted us to have a relationship with that which is invisible. So these people of old had a relationship with the spirit of Christ, which was in them both signifying of his suffering and his glory. Continue. To them, it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit. So sent from they had the spirit of Christ. Now the Holy Ghost is the one doing the signifying. That's why, that's what Jesus told them in John 16, 12, 13. I quote it by memory. Jesus says, I have many things to say unto you, but you can't bear it. How be it when he, the spirit of truth come, he will lead you and guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own initiative, but what I have already spoken to you, he will bring you the revelation of. He will bring you into the spirit of. And so it, it tells us in Romans 8, 14, as many as are led by that spirit, they are the children of a living God because they're in relationship with God and not in religion. Continue. 
things which angels desire to look into. And so the angels are sitting here listening to my message. They love coming to my service. I have more angels listening to me than humans. <laughs> it's always been that way since I've been saved and I start ministering. They wanted to, they want to see now what is the Holy Ghost saying? Because see, in, in the Old Testament, they had the Spirit of Christ. You and I have both the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, the other comforter. We have two comforters where we can tell people about our relationship with the Holy Ghost and with Christ. So religion can't tell those people that. They have to tell the stories of other people's relationship. They got to talk about David. They have to talk about Solomon. They have to talk about Daniel. They have to talk about someone in where? In the old covenant. Because when you get to the new covenant, when, when God decided to start the church age, it's called the Acts of the Apostles. So we, we have the story of John and Peter and, and Paul and, and Barnabas and Silas. See, we have the testimony of people in relationship. Because remember, Paul was on the road to Damascus persecuting people with relationship based off of his religion. And then he, he gets knocked off his horse, he's blinded, it, and he asked the person who blinded him, who art thou? And he says, Jesus, whom you persecuted. So that moment began a relationship with Jesus the Christ. John 7, uh, verse 28. And so I want to bring to the audience that listens to me, bring to their revelation, the audience that listen to me, the difference between being in religion and being in relationship. John 7, 28. Then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple, saying, You both know me, and you know where I am from. And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. So he taught where? In the temple. So Jesus is trying to teach the people in religion about having a relationship with him. They're going to throw him out of the temple because they don't want to have a relationship. But this is not something new. For when they came out of Egypt, the Hebrews, God brought them to the mountain of the angel of the Lord there. And they say, we don't want to be in relationship with you. So they wandered for 40 years before they could come into the land of promise. And even then, they did not want to be in relationship. So Joshua called all of those people there after they fought seven years of war and conquered all 30 some kings and seven kingdom. Joshua calls them and says, you cannot serve the God that I'm in relationship with. You are in relationship with gods over, the, uh, over in the days of the flood, the gods of Egypt, gods in the land, the wilderness, gods in the promised land. But as for me and my house, we will stay in relationship with God. And they said, you see, and he told them, God is a jealous God. And that day they said, we will put away all of our gods. Notice that they had them too. And Joshua said, He's jealous. You can put away an image of your God, but God sees your heart. You can stop doing certain things on the outside. Jesus said, if a man looks on a woman to commit an act, he has committed the act in his heart and therefore is guilty of the very act that he has not committed with his flesh. John 14, verse 7. And so Jesus here in the gospel of John, it, John, John is one of the most powerful persons of all the Old Testament apostles and saints that had a relationship with Jesus. So in his writings, it's powerful. What? The, 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 the idea of relationship. John 7, I'm sorry, 14, 7. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. 
Why? Because we saw Jesus. They say, show us the Father. And he said, you don't understand. If you've seen me, you've seen him because I am the representation of who he is. He's invisible. And he wants you to be in relationship with something invisible. But before he did that, he made some substance and says, see, I, I, I'm, I'm here, but I'm not here. I'm flesh, but I'm not flesh. John 15, 21. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. And that's what the church did to me. I came out of the Catholic church only to go into a Pentecostal church of religion. And they were so jealous of my relationship with God. They actually could not believe it was possible to be in relationship with God that God would talk and manifest himself to such a person as myself. And so I had jealousy coming from the highest office, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastor, the teachers. The day they call that the fivefold ministry. And I found out in the fivefold ministry of religion, there's jealousy. I would leave that organization and try to work with other men of God who was jealous of a relationship that I have with God. So the Lord told me, they will treat you like this because of my name, since they did not know the one who sent me. And I marvel at all the anointing that my brethren have. But when it came from hearing his voice, even like with what happened with the COVID, what happened with, with the pandemic, what happened with the vaccination, what happened with uh, the elections and Black Lives Matter, I, I, I marvel that they did not know him. They knew their own kind. They knew their people of their Pacific persuasion. So blacks know blacks, white know white, Hispanics know Hispanics. Uh, uh, you just name it. And, the, and where you look, the Democrats know the Democrats, the Republicans know the Republicans. You, you, you see, I found out that they had more relationship with their organizations than with Jesus the Christ. I marvel how God began to use everything I just named to separate those in relationship with him and those that were stuck in religion. First John 2.23 Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. And so notice that the Son was in human form. The Father was in spirit form. But this is what Paul would write later on in one of his epistles, that the invisible one, the Father, was in Christ, the one we saw, reconciling the world to himself, trying to bring us into a relationship And then Jesus is going to be crucified so that the relationship would then go into the spirit realm and not always stay in the fresh flesh realm. And so Paul said, henceforth, I don't know anyone after the flesh. You know what he said? Not even Christ. Because Christ was only here temporarily to introduce us to the spirit of God. When one knows God and Jesus, his son, they will be, be by this knowledge, by that knowledge of knowing the two of them, they will know both the spirit, the spirit of God, as well as understand the flesh of Jesus. 
Why did Jesus come into the flesh? The primary reason most people will say is to deal with sin. I know that that reason is the reason he came in the flesh, but I believe the primary reason was to be in relationship with God because he already knew in the flesh dwelleth no good thing. So, so well aware of that, somebody came and called him good. And he said, why do you call me good? Because he knew what he was. He was in sinful flesh. He said, why call me good? There's none good but the invisible one. There's none good but the one you cannot see. John 4.22 Starting with John 4.22, let's read those, a few of those verses. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So the Samaritans are... The Samaritans are part of the 10 lost tribes. And they were the, the, they were the remnant of, the, uh, of the, the ones that were taken into captivity and were called the lost ones. So Samaria was the capital where they had set up the temple for the 10 tribes for that nation there called Israel. The other nation was called Judah, where we get the word Jews from. And their capital was Jerusalem, where they had their temple. So Jesus told them, your temple is full of demons. Whereas the temple that Solomon, they had a presence from God. So he said, y'all don't even know what y'all worshiping. We know what we worship in, but the hours coming in there is where we won't be worshiping the one that's in that temple nor the ones that are over there in your temple. Notice he says, not even the one in their temple. <laughs> Why? Because God is the spirit and they that worship God, go ahead. Must worship him in spirit and truth. Go ahead. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. I know. So in religion, they knew a Messiah was coming. Go ahead. Who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. So she knows, see, religion knows about the Messiah. Religion knows all about all of the stuff, except what I'm talking about. <laughs> see, religion knows that there's Jesus, he was coming. But when he came, nobody was expecting him to come where they knew that. Here come people from a foreign land. We call them the wise men. Bearing gifts, they go to the palace of the king, and the king, like, no, 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 no. I'm the only king here. And remember, he killed all of his sons but one or two. So he was like, no, I ain't got no more new baby born. They, but they say, but you understand, we saw his star. And we, we, that was enough for us to come to, watch this, worship him. See, in real relationship, you will come to worship him. And, and, and so, worship by definition is the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. These people left foreign lands where it took almost a year to two to travel. One direction in those days. They ain't have jets. They didn't have ocean liners. They didn't have vehicles. Mm -hmm. So they're coming in on their camels and, and their mules and their horses and donkeys. And, and they're being gripped. And this was a large group. If you're reading in the gospel, it said they terrified the whole area. It was so many of them. But again, they came to worship him. And that was the star. And worship is the continuous outpouring of all that I am all that I do, and all that I can ever become. They poured out 
They were willing to bring gold and myrrh and frankincense, but the best of spices that money could buy and gold, uh, better than 24 karat gold. I mean, worship is the right, fitting, and delightful response of all those chosen by God. All those chosen by God will come. And these people are the descendants of Abraham who didn't have religion. These are the children of Keturah in Genesis 25, where Abraham gave gifts. And he told them one day, you will see these stars and you will see his stars in the midst of that star. When you see that, the gifts that I'm giving you, bring to the people where they're going to have temples and religious because they won't even know he's there. <laughs> And so what do Herod do? He called the scribes, the people that have, the, and that's what you do. You got all of these people in churches today with the book, but they don't even know the same way they didn't know when he was coming the first time. They won't know when he's coming the second, the third, or the fourth. So Jesus said, if I come in the first, second, or third watch, you must watch and pray. You don't know when I'm coming back because you're not in relationship with me worship is communion with god in which in which believers by grace center their minds attention and hearts affection on the lord humbly glorifying god in response to the greatness of his word worship is a response these men came to worship him because they knew who he was just by his star not, notice they did not need any scriptures. Notice they didn't have the scriptures. The Pharisees had the scriptures. The Sadducees had the scriptures. Notice they didn't have a temple. The, the people with the temple, the people with the scriptures, they were not worshiping him. The woman at the well said, the Messiah will come. You know what Jesus is going to say? I am he. He doesn't hide from her. She was at the well. She was thirsty. There are people in churches today that are thirsty for a relationship with God. And they stand before people that can only give them religions. They have the scriptures, just like the scribes. But they don't know how to get you in relationship with God because they are afraid they will lose the relationship that you have with them. Worship is the inner essence of worship is to know God truly and then respond from the heart to that knowledge of valuing your God. You put a great value to God. You treasure God. He becomes your treasure. You prize God. He, he is the greatest prize you can ever win in, in, in this world and the world to come. You enjoy God. You look forward every day to have that relationship renewed. As soon as your eyes open, you talk to him. You commune with him. And you are satisfied with God above all other earth, earthly things. There's nothing that can satisfy you as much as God can. And man, I'm telling you, when you understand the definition of worship as you're hearing it from me, you can understand what these people came to do wearing their gifts. Satisfaction in God, it overflows and to a point where you demonstrate <laughs> your acts of praise. Not only from your lips, but from your deeds and the things you do. Christian worship is the response of God's redeemed people to his self-revelation, exhorting God's glory in Christ in our minds, in our affections, and, and, and all of this being motivated by the power of the Holy Ghost that walks in, works in us. The power of the Holy Ghost works in us. And, and the Bible says we don't know what we should pray, but he makes utterance with strong moaning and groaning like, give him the praise, give him the glory. 
And reverence definition, if you know the reference, it means the deep respect for someone or something. So we reverence God. You see a lack of reverence in our world where we live. There's no reference for anyone in authority. They defund the police. Uh, the, they talk about the president. They talk about the mayor. They talk about the governor. There's no respect. They call each other names. This one, this party doesn't respect this person or that party. And you see that in the Republican Party. You see that in the Democrat Party. You see, and so they teach their people. And then you have people with the title of Christian don't know that you honor all those in authority, even those that don't agree with you. So how can they honor God who they cannot see when they can't honor man who they can see where the powers of be are ordained of God? Then, so adoration. That's another part of worship. It's reverence and adoration. What is the definition of adoration? Deep love and respect. <laughs> notice that both reverence is deep something, deep respect, and, and notice adoration is deep love and respect. Biblically, the noun adoration comes from the Latin word adoration, which means worship. Do you know that adoration actually means worship? particularly in a religious way. Adoration is mainly used in religion for a deep respect and reverence to God. So it's still used today like adoration of God. But in our day and in this generation we live in, the word is rarely used now at all. When I was a young boy, I could hear the word adoration. But now today, if you was to Google this, you would see that the word adoration is almost extinct because the reverence of God and the respect of God or the deep respect of God, the deep adoration, all of this, the deep reverence for God is a thing of the past. There's only a few of us left. John 4.23. It's time to give you a scripture. <laughs> <laughs> so we're but, in John 4.23. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. So I gave you the definition of those words so you can understand what he's seeking. <laughs> Because you say the word worship and the spirit of truth today, you didn't get you don't get that definite those definitions that I gave you. You see, I had to look up those definitions, write them down so I can make sure that the audience that listen to me may know what worship is. <laughs> Continue. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And so God is near those who wants to be near to him. Psalms 145 verse 18. You have to understand something. God ain't near people who go to church. God is near those who go to church who want to be close to him while they're in church and when they are out of church. Go ahead. Psalms 145 18. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. To all. So remember now, we read it already in the Gospel of John. Those that call on him in truth. What do it mean to worship God in spirit and truth? It means the truth part is I really want to be close to you. Not telling the truth. We, but most people, when they hear that word worship in spirit and truth, they talk, they think, well, oh, that means don't tell a lie. No, it means you really want to be in relationship with God. That's the truth. <laughs> oh, the, the Lord is near to all who call. See, you call on him. To all who call out to him, how? In truth. I, 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 in other words, you don't try to play God. 
Use God to find a husband. Use God to find a wife. Use God to get a promotion. That's the, what you got in churches. People that need a house or they need, they need things. Jesus said, don't take any thought for the things you need, the food for your belly, the clothes for, for, on, your, on your back, or the roof over your head. Your father already know about that. Don't come in the house asking for that, Jesus said. Come and say to God, I want to know you because he is near those who call on him from truth, not with a motive. You can't play God. So Paul was full of religion. Philippians 3, starting with verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you, it is safe. He said, I need you to be happy with your relationship. And so I'm going to write something because I have to clear this up, he says to the Philippians. Go ahead. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So he said, beware of those people in the church that are trying to tell you, you know what, you got to keep the Sabbath, don't eat meat, don't do this. He said, that's all religion. That's what God gave Moses for those people who did not want relationship. He said, you got to beware of people who put all kind of Old Testament law. I would tell people, if you don't find it in the New Testament, why are you doing it from the Old? We're not under the Old Covenant. I, I, you know, I always tell that to Christians. I tell that to pastors. I tell that to prophets, why are you stuck in Old Testament when you are under the New Covenant? The Old Covenant was given to slaves. The New Covenant is given to those whom the Son set free, and they're free indeed. <laughs> We're not slaves in bondage. We are the free one. And Paul used that allegory between Ishmael and Isaac. He used that between Jacob and Esau. He shows us the difference between being under law and being under grace. Keep reading. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. So he says, I of all people can have confidence in the flesh. I know what it's like to be in re re relationship and I know what it's like to be in religion. So what is it like to be in religion, Paul? Continue. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. So I'm circumcised, you know, to prove that I'm Jewish and the Jewish religion, I'm circumcised. And I was circumcised on the eighth day, not the ninth, not the tenth. I'm circumcised on the eighth day and I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. Go ahead. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Go ahead. Concerning the law, a Pharisee. And concerning the law, I'm in the high sect of Jewish religion. That's like being Pentecostal in the Christian religion. He said, of religion, I am in the highest sect of the religions of the earth in that day and time, he said. The day the Pentecostals will be considered the highest sect of the Christian religion. Go ahead. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. And concerning zeal, I had to deal with all of those people who were in relationship. <laughs> those that had walked with Jesus, the apostles and the people that he fed. And I, I, everyone that was in relationship with that man named Christ. Jesus the Christ, I made sure based off of my zeal and based off of my relationship with, in, with, with scriptures in the Old Testament, I had to get them. Go ahead. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. I was blameless when it come to religion. I was blameless when it come to religion. But I had no relationship. Go ahead. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. I didn't, until he blinded me, knocked me off my high horse. See, God has to knock you off your high horse, pastor, prophet, evangelist, teachers. All of you listening to me, deacons, deaconess, elders, 
Bishops, God must knock you off your high horse because your pride is in whatever your doctrine is, but not in your relationship. Continue. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Can my you Lord. let that be your testimony as well? For, for are you willing to get a relationship with God by letting go your pride and joy, your religion, your keeping of the Sabbath, your not eating pork, mm -hmm. your your your. All of your religious ways you got from that old covenant. Can you let that stuff go? Continue. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. And, and so in order for me to gain Christ, I not only came out of the Catholic church, I came out of the Pentecostal church. You see, I came out of Catholicism, then I came out of Pentecostalism. <laughs> I came out of all of those ism and lism, and now here I am, preaching to those of you that are listening to me, and I'm telling you, if God is my witness, there is nothing in the world as precious as having a relationship with the one that's invisible. Continue and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness. Not which, having the righteousness that comes from religion. Go ahead. Which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. And so as the reason I came out of the Pentecostal church, I want you to know this Pentecostal church that I came out has over 20 million members. It's one of the largest Pentecostal churches in the world. It is known, if you Google it, to have the highest do Christian doctrine on the earth today. And the Lord visited me. He said, I need you to give that up. I need you to leave the fivefold ministry. I need you to all of this stuff and the pride they got. And so when I came out, the year after I came out, they had a church split. But I told them that before the church split, that God was going to judge all of it because they were on a high horse. They could do, they could cast demons out. They could raise the dead. They could heal the sick. They could lay hands on the blind and the blind see. The lame could walk, the deaf and dumb could see and speak and hear. They could do all of those things. And yet, many of them lacked a relationship with the one who's invisible. And their whole pride was in their doctrines of eunuchship, divine healing. They start lifting up doctrines more than the person. And so God hit that church. And that wasn't the first time he hit it. He hits it. He hits it the same way he did the Jews and, and the Hebrews. He, he, he got rid of the tabernacle of Moses. He got rid of the temple of Solomon. You see, God has been giving us a sign ever since the beginning. He took down that structure called the tabernacle because it was a temple made by hands. He took down the temple of Solomon. Why? Because it was a structure made by hands. Even though the prophets told him, God cannot dwell in any temple made by hand. But in the New Testament, we find out, no, you're not. Your body is the temple of God. No, you're not. <laughs> Don't you know who you are? And so Jesus says, tear down this church. In three days, I raise up another one. But this spoke he of the temple of his body. Continue. That I may know him. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. And the power of the resurrection. So that I can go from this physical body, die, and be resurrected with my spirit. That I can see God in the spirit being a spirit. Because right now my flesh cannot look at God without screaming and hollering. Romans 2.29 That he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, 
in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. And so we are the true circumcision, not those people over in Israel fighting for the fighting for land. Our land don't, it doesn't exist down here. See, you had the land of promise and the promised land. The land of promise is the one above. That's where Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be. The other one is down here for the descendants of Abraham. But God divorced them, if you read that. And he gave them a bill of divorcement. So they're telling everybody that's their land. But before it was their land, it was Canaan's land. That's what it was called, the land of Canaan. But God divorced Canaan and gave it to the Hebrews or the Jews. Then he divorced them and he gave it to the Arabs and the Muslims. And, and so notice that God will divorce you. Why? Because you're not in relationship with him. And we don't, we, we, we're not fighting for that land. So Paul wrote, Jerusalem above is the mother of us all. He told us Jerusalem beneath is in bondage with his children. You read that in Galatians, you read that in Hebrews, and you act like you're deaf and dumb. Why? Because you want a temple made with hands, where God has given you, you as his temple. But you don't want relationship with God inside because he sees your thoughts. He sees your emotions. And you don't want God spying on you from the inside out. You want to be able to tell God how you feel and what, what you are thinking. Well, God said, don't you know, I put my spirit in you, in your mind and in your heart. And that's what he says. I will come in your heart. I will come in your mind and I will see the truth so that you can worship me in spirit and in truth. So the written code, this the written code of the Old Testament separate us from the written code of the New Testament. Because Paul said we have this law now written on our heart and not on stones. There's a code written on stones and there's a code written on our hearts. The one written on stone is called religion. Whereas the one written on our heart is called spirit. 2 Corinthians 11, 18. Seeing that many boast according to the flesh, I also will boast. So he had to boast of, about being a Pharisee and being, being of the tribe of Benjamin and a Hebrew of Hebrew. I do the same thing now with Pentecostals. Concerning the Pentecostal faith, I was blameless. Concerning the law of, of both the Old and New Testament, I walk with a clear conscience, with a pure heart. Don't you know the pure in heart shall see God? And so God asked me, he said, I need you to put all of that on the altar there. All that after 10 years of walking blameless, the Lord says, I want you to leave the Pentecostal church as, as, a, as, as a minister. Do you know what they offer me? I had six or eight churches offer me some of the highest position in the organization you can possibly be in. And the Lord made it hard for me. He said, you could be one of the highest ministers in the people with 20 million. You can be one of the highest persons in the one with 1 million. You can be, in, in other words, I had to say no. And I started redemption ministry. Oh, you talking about people with issues. <laughs> the Lord said, I, and, and because I gave up my righteousness, people could come to my church. Sinners could get close to me because I, I lowered the bar because I put everything on the altar. And when you put your righteousness on the altar of God, God fire come and he will burn it down where you have to walk by faith and not by sight. Where, where, where you are afraid because you're not in your strength anymore. You're walking by the pure mercies of God. Things that I was not attracted to became attracted all of a sudden. Things that I had the victory over all of a sudden, now I was weak all of a sudden. Once I put my strength and the power of my, my religion on the altar of God as a Pentecostal pastor, having all things in order, having a testimony within the church and outside of the church, blameless like Paul, now I know who he is. <laughs> and that's the Christ that I preach. 
So the Apostle Paul used his history and religion to denounce the working of the flesh. He was willing to give up his religion to have a relationship with God. And so we read in Philippians where he said, I count all things as done. Then Philippians 3, 8 to 10, we don't have to read those verses again. Paul wanted us to know the Lord and the Father through faith. Romans 1, 17. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So God had me give up the Pentecostal faith, the Baptist faith, the Catholic faith. Romans 9, verse 30. God wanted me to start walking, not in the strength of religion, but in the, in the strength of the Holy Spirit. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. And so that's what I preach. I preach the righteousness that you attain to, not by works, but by faith that do work. <laughs> you see, once you get the faith that, and faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 8 verse 1. Why? Because when you get that and start walking in, in the spirit, guess what happens? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. There's no more condemnation. You don't, you, ha you don't have to worry about your weaknesses. You don't have to worry about your failures because the Holy Spirit sees that that is really the truth. He knows you really are weak. And so he does not condemn you. There is no condemnation. Just like you don't condemn, you don't condemn babies who mess on themselves. <laughs> you, you don't condemn babies that don't have a walk yet. You know, all of that is training, all of that. And it takes time and takes patience of the parent. And so the Lord will give you shepherds to help you work out your salvation with fear and trembling so that you can go from faith to faith, from glory to glory. You begin to grow just like a child grow. So Jesus told him in John 2, 19, I have a quote it there. Jesus said, right, destroy this temple. And in three days, I'm going to raise it up again. But this spoke he of his flesh, his body. And so the Lord says, if you come out of religion and let me be Lord inside your temple, your body, I will build you up in ways you will not be able to dream. Matthew 16, 21. And so they, so what did they do that? So Jesus told them, and this is, listen with, listen with what Matthew wrote. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. He had to show them that religion going to kill him. Religion will always kill the relationship with God. Religion will always kill the relationship of God. The high priest will come and get you. The Pharisee will come and get you. The scribes and the Sadducees will come and get you. The government will come and get you. So Matthew 26, verse 61. And so, with, and so religion took Jesus to punch his palate. The high priest says, look, you got to get rid of this man who's trying to get us into a relationship with God. We told this man when, when we came out of Egypt and in Moses led us, we told God to his face, we don't want a relationship with you. Give us a pastor to tell us about you. Let Moses come off the mountain. We don't want you to tell us personally. We don't want you inside our temple, our body. We will make a temple and we will decide whether or not we will go to it to hear anything that will convict us of sin or righteousness or judgment. We don't want the Holy Spirit to do that. We want man and we will decide what day to show up to listen to that man and so that we can know who you are. Continue. And said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. 
And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look we, now. Don't, we don't need anybody to tell us about having a relationship with a God outside our world. <laughs> he said, henceforth, you're going to see me not in your world. You're going to see me in that world. And you're going to see me coming in the clouds with the mighty angels of God. And the same way I destroyed your tabernacle, the same way I destroyed your temple, I'm going to destroy your body that I gave you to be a temple. And so Matthew 27, 40, he's up on the cross. And this is what the people had to say to him. Listen to what they said to him. And saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. And so they want me to come down from the cross that I suffer for being in relationship with God. Morning by morning, he wakes up my ear to hear is the learned, and I'm not rebellious. He wakes me up at three in the morning, sometimes four in the morning, sometimes seven or eight in the morning. I can be in the yard working and he walks up and talks to me. I'm cutting grass or, or, or I, I could be uh, in the car driving and he talks to me. I can be taking a shower or in the restroom for other reasons. And you know what he does? He shows up to talk to me. I cannot put in words the relationship that I had with God. And so I can say to all of you that listen to me, there's a difference between religion and relationship. If you have a chance to go back and, and listen to this again, please do. And ask yourself, are you in religion or are you in a relationship? And if you have not subscribed to this channel, please subscribe. And if you don't mind, can you put a like on, on my videos when you listen to them? And then to him that is able to keep us from falling, the one that can present us faultless before the throne of grace to the only wise God, our Savior, be majesty and power both now and forever. Amen and amen. God bless all of you.